Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sam Quinlan, and on behalf of High Watch Recovery, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the winter and fall webinar series. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Danziger. Um, we've worked on and off and known each other for, for, for quite a few years now, and uh, there are many, many bows to his, to his expertise. Today in particular, um, he will be presenting on the clinical dharma, a path for healers and helpers. So Stephen is he's an international trainer in mindfulness and Buddhism and has been practicing for over 30 years. He's also a master EMDR therapist and uh, an international provider of EMDR training. He founded the Meta Protocol, which utilizes both mindfulness and EMDR, and probably will touch on, on, on some of that this, this afternoon. Aside from that, he is also, which is extremely exciting, and hopefully we'll have him back again to talk to us more about it, but he's also head of health and well-being for Drop Labs, which is a company and creators of immersion, sound, and technology. Um, and using that therapeutically, again, um, along the lines of EMDR. So honestly, such a privilege to have you here this afternoon, Stephen, and um, thank you for giving us your time. And after the presentation, we'll take some uh, question Q and A's. Um, but for now, I shall let you take the floor and uh, I shall hand it over to you. Um, just give me two seconds. I'm just having that done now. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Sam. And thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. And I'm so glad that you all decided to take some time out of your day and also some time in the midst, like Sam said, of all the webinars, all the work that we do online. Uh, I know that some of us are hitting that point of Zoom fatigue, um, but thank goodness for this technology, right? I mean, we've stayed connected and I've stayed connected, I know that, um, for these last many months. And so I'm hoping that uh, what it is I have to offer today is gonna be helpful. And when I, uh, Sam and I were talking about what I would, you know, bring today. Uh, I think I can't remember which one of us landed on it first, but you know, Clinical Dharma is a uh, a book that I wrote in 2016, or and uh, at that time, uh, it was really the kind of foundation of anything and everything that I've been thinking about for almost you know for almost 30 years, or the culmination, I guess, uh, and. Uh, I'll obviously say a lot more about that as I go along, um, but it really is, uh, it's been uh, pr pretty much a huge part of my journey over the last months is to see how 2016, this was kind of necessary. Uh, 2020, this kind of uh, practice or knowledge or both is critical um, just for us to be able to take care of ourselves doing the work that we do as, as healers, as helpers. And then there's also that point of how pretty much all of us have been thrust into all kinds of helper roles that uh, may have been part of our lives before, but now are expanded and made more acute. And, you know, as in, I, you know, like I have a fifth grader right now upstairs in the house that is here 24 seven, 365 instead of at school. And so that relationship, that uh, need for help has, has changed. And so I've really had to lean into what it is that I'm actually gonna be talking about today. So um, Sam hit most of these points. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, 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 point out a couple though. Uh, one is that I did spend a year at a Zen Buddhist monastery, the monastery where I arrived for an AA retreat when I had about four months sober. Um, I arrived there when my best friend, he was my new best friend then, he's still my best friend today. 
uh, said, do you want to go on an AA retreat? I said, that sounds stupid and boring. And then he said, it's at a Zen monastery. I said, that sounds awesome and exotic and weird. Let's do it. And I got there and I got struck mindful. I got struck with the need to sit down and meditate. And so I've been doing it ever since. And in 1998, I did spend a year there uh, meditating for four hours a day on a regular day, 10 to 14 hours on a retreat day. I like to say I did that so you don't have to. Um, one of the biggest lessons that I learned there is that it doesn't take that uh, to be able to, to take care of oneself. Uh, more on that as, as we go. Um, I also just want to point out uh, also, uh, I had a 15 year career as a social justice and diversity and inclusion educator, uh, where a lot of this material actually is where it got developed uh, in as much as uh, I realized that, uh, first of all, my, my Buddhist practice was not just like a mindfulness techniques to help me out in the world. Uh, it was a complete program, almost a lifestyle change um, and uh, a guide, guideposts and guide rails uh, for me to understand the world, understand the world of suffering and understand the world of uh, healing, uh, not just for me, not just for the people in the room that I was with at the time, but for, you know, as we say in Buddhist practice, all beings. And that's been uh, obviously uh, something that I've had to uh, re-engage with uh, over the last year, uh, you know, uh, glad, gladly so. Um, and I'll probably say a little bit more about the meta protocol, uh, like Sam was indicating, you know, talking about mindfulness and EMDR and how they, uh, how it all uh, goes together. And that is definitely part of uh, what we're talking about. And I've written a few books, um, Clinical Dharma, and then I've written a book on EMDR therapy and mindfulness for trauma focused care with my colleague, Jamie Marich. And we're currently finishing a similar book about healing addiction. Uh, with uh, EMDR therapy. I also did an anger management book, Mindfulness for Anger Management, um, which is also helpful these days. Uh, and then recently, Jamie and I came out with a couple of uh, uh, books that go with her book, Trauma and the 12 Steps. So a lot of focus on trauma, a lot of focus on all the ways that we can heal trauma and all of it sort of shot through with uh, mindfulness. And then that last piece is I'm, in a program at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Masters in Healthcare Innovation, where I'm actually surrounded by over a hundred doctors, researchers, nurses, you know, uh, leaders in the uh, health field, uh, trying to figure out how to best take care of ourselves and also how to take care of others uh, in new ways in these difficult times. Uh, so I always have this slide here, just so you know, um, I have a company that, that does all this stuff and so, um, you know, uh, it's not as uh, pertinent when it comes to clinical dharma, but it's pertinent. So here's who I am with, uh, with those possible, um, those financial aspects of my life. So uh, our objectives for today, or what I'd like to talk about today is first of all, look at compassion fatigue, which is a term I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point. Um, just not even from the pandemic, but uh, beforehand. Uh, it's something that was identified many years ago and is particular to the work that we do. Uh, and then the other term uh, that is related to it uh, that has been identified maybe later than the, uh, compassion fatigue is vicarious trauma. Uh, as we've gotten more familiar with uh, the world of trauma and the role of trauma in people's difficulties, including addiction and other mental health issues, um, we've had to look more closely at the vicarious trauma, the trauma that we experience when we're helping someone else who's going through their own trauma. So uh, then what I'm sharing with you today is what I've understood from the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path of the Historical Buddha, how that might serve as a system to help us to deal with compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma. And then lastly, um, looking at how uh, applying these principles and these uh, 
techniques and skills uh, is a parallel process. It's something that is growing us personally and growing us professionally, hopefully to the point where you can't even kind of see the difference. That we're, we're basically bringing uh, mindfulness and, and the Eightfold Path to our lives as a whole. And through that, that then registers both with our clients or the people that we're helping. And it also uh, allows us to literally proactively bring these kinds of skills uh, to our clients. And so, um, and, and this that I'm talking about, like I was saying, I, I would probably reference the Meta Protocol and EMDR. Uh, in the Meta Protocol, clinical dharma is at the heart of the work that we're doing in that everyone, every, this is pertinent for everyone. The CEO of a company, a person who's working as line staff, all of us need to be able to take care of ourselves in this way or in a similar way in order to do the work that we do with the community that we work with. So let's talk about compassion, fatigue, and uh, vicarious trauma and the difficulties that come up um, in our work, the problem as it were. So um, indirect exposure to trauma gives the same possible results as the direct exposure to trauma. Um, think about any time you've opened up your phone first thing in the morning and you read the news, right? Immediately, because of the way technology is working us right now, uh, we are fed and we're exposed to uh, trauma. A lot of folks I know have been talking about, you know, the last four or five years particularly, with all of just the chaos, the different kinds of chaos in the world, um, just feeling this feeling of like, do I have PTSD? Did something happen to me that I don't even remember? And for some of us, yes. And for some of us, just there was just quite enough happening or there's quite enough happening right now. And then when we look at the pandemic, right? Every day we wake up and we're all together in this, um, in this global trauma, essentially. So both experienced and witnessed. And so it has been called uh, vicarious traumatization, secondary traumatic stress, and also compassion fatigue. And it's basically, and always has been, um, but now we're talking about it a little bit more proactively, it always has been an, uh, an occupational hazard of clinical work, uh, whether we're clinical staff or non-clinical staff. And there's a growing body, I would say, uh, you know, bordering on, call it evidence-based body of research at this point on uh, the problem and, you know, the, the effects and what the possible solutions are. So I'm going to read this uh, out loud as a quote. A vicarious traumatization refers to a transformation in cognitive schemas and belief systems resulting from empathic engagement with clients' traumatic experiences that may result in significant disruptions in one's sense of meaning, connection, identity, and worldview, as well as in one's affect tolerance, psychological needs, belief about self and other, interpersonal relationships, and sensory memory. So basically that's the whole package, right? In other words, this can shift our entire existential system and it can shift our just day-to-day -day functioning. And what's the, the problem? The problem is I went into empathic engagement with someone. That started the train rolling. That positive, uh, human, uh, absolutely uh, mystically beautiful engagement has brought us in, call it harm's way, if we're not able to find some way to uh, monitor that and then work with that. So one definition uh, talks about um, uh, it the emotions that result from knowing about a traumatizing event experienced by a significant other, right? Significant other in this case being our client or someone that we're working with in, from a, a helping position. And then that stress that comes with wanting to help 
them in their suffering. And oftentimes, especially when we're talking about trauma, uh, it takes a while. So we end up having to sit with a lot of really deep suffering uh, before we may witness um, some of the symptom relief and the healing and the, and the, the health. So how do we sit with that? Um, and then some traumatic exposure is, uh, is very indirect, but it can have the same exact symptoms as someone who witnessed something. It could basically flourish into diagnosable PTSD. Um, a lot of that I got to sort of witness um, firsthand and I'm witnessing it a lot today too. Uh, I was still living in New York. I'm from New York City originally. And I moved to LA in 2002. So I was still in New York uh, on 9-11. And I noticed, you know, there are many, many people who were either saw what happened or even firefighters I knew, et cetera. And some of them got PTSD and some of them didn't. Then I knew lots of people who weren't even in town that day, like me, uh, but, uh, and then others who, you know, were uptown, didn't know it happened until they saw it on TV, like anyone else in the country, and they got PTSD, right? Like, in other words, it's secondary vicarious trauma has as much a possibility of developing into a problem. So then compassion fatigue is more specific to the work that we do in as much as it really talks about um, that which you see in all kinds of healthcare settings particularly, but also social work settings or anywhere where there's uh, people, uh, our job is to help people who are suffering in a direct fashion. And so that requires me to be ready to be compassionate every day when I show up to work. It's part of the job description. Sure, it's part of a lot of job descriptions, but here it's to a whole other level. And so compassion fatigue is really pointing at the cumulative effects of what we're talking about here, the secondary tra uh, traumatization, the vicarious traumatization, the ongoing, uh, engagement of our compassion muscle over and over and over again and towards many people, right? It's not even one person. Sometimes it's one person at a time. Sometimes it's a, a group of people, but always that compassion is sort of triggering the whole process. It's informing the process. It's creating and, and providing the process. Um, so uh, of course, like anyone else with anything else that requires a lot of effort, um, we can get fatigued. So um, that empty tank image is very pertinent. Um, I remember one of the things that I loved about um, those of you fam familiar with Julia Cameron's work, The Artist's Way, uh, when she talked about one of the most important things that the artist needs to do is to fill the well, right? Like that we can't just be output, output, output. We need input. We need, we need love. We need input and love and inspiration and all of that. And what happens is that in our field and fields like it, uh, there's can often be, or at least perceived to be, but sometimes it's just the truth. Like in terms of the time-space continuum, there's like no time, right? To be able to fill the well. And we need to find ways to literally proactively just make the space for it. And so um, when we look at the meaning of compassion here, um, midway through this uh, slide, the meaning of compassion is to bear suffering. Compassion fatigue, like any other kind of fatigue, reduces our capacity or our interest or both in bearing the suffering of others. Even those of us who are, you know, Mother Teresa level compassionate by nature, give us enough, you know, enough time and enough lack of ability to uh, modulate um, what's happening uh, in these engagements. 
and we're gonna run out of gas. So then there's what it does to our work, right? That's what it does to us personally. What it does to our work is that we're not as good at what we do, right? Like the compassion, I feel like, and I talk about a lot of this in the book, I, I talk about how compassion brings probably about 98% of the people I know to the work that we do, right? There's, a, another, there's other folks who come to it. I, I, I don't know what the, the, the idea is, but a vast majority of us start from, I wanna help people, right? And so then when, you, when we get compassion fatigue, that muscle is atrophied and we just don't have, uh, that might not be the right word, that's from lack of use. That muscle is uh, pull, we pull a muscle, <laughs> we sprain it, right? And we're not in, in uh, our fullest uh, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health. It can have all of those manifestations. So for instance, um, from this 1997 uh, study, uh, they looked at social workers and they would misdiagnose bad treatment planning, even abuse of clients. Um, because of compassion fatigue. A lot of times when we see things go wrong in those kinds of ways, a lot of it is not just uh, fatigue, but compassion fatigue. And so obviously we need to uh, buffer against this somehow. Um, and then when we think about uh, specifically therapists and trauma therapy in particular, um, the stress generated from doing this therapy can accumulate over time if not dealt with in some way. And we can end up making mistakes, misjudgments, clinical errors. So I'm gonna actually move us right to the solution uh, from there. I'll be bringing the problem in plenty, uh, but I uh, wanna talk a little bit about uh, this particular solution which again, I did not create out of a vacuum. I basically, uh, in a sense, adapted, adopted uh, 2,600 year old wisdom. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the thinking behind uh, why this might be a good starting place, if not uh, a set of guidelines uh, to help us to um, remain in our fullest compassionate health. So, um, so my hope was to come up with a formula or use the original formulation of the historical Buddha to have a sustainable path for the healer and helper. Because that's what we're talking about. Um, compassion fatigue basically takes away the sustainability. It makes it so that, and this is an old statistic and I should really do my due diligence and maybe find a more modern statistic I don't think I'm gonna find anything that much different. But many years ago, I saw a statistic that said the average shelf life or the average career length, not job length, career length of a person in the addiction treatment field from administrative to line staff and otherwise was 18 months. That a significant number of people would come in, I'm gonna, save a lot of people, I'm gonna help a lot of people and they burn out and I would say, you know, potentially a large, to a large degree because of compassion fatigue in a very short period of time. So my thought was develop our own practice and then through developing that practice that just sustains us, just using the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path of the Historical Buddha as a way of proceeding forward. And again, there's other models. Um, this is the model that uh, has made sense to me for the last 30 years. So a little bit about the Buddha. Um, those of you who are familiar with the story, uh, here's a version of it, a short version of it, and those of you who are not. Uh, so he was royalty. He grew up as a royal. Uh, in an area that uh, Northern India and Nepal, depending on uh, when we're talking about. And he uh, was, uh, his father was told when he was born 
that he's either going to be a great spiritual leader or a king like him. And so his dad was like, I don't want him being some spiritual guy. I want him to be a king. And so he basically uh, put palace walls and all kinds of ways to make sure that Buddha did not see any suffering, that he just lived a life of leisure and love and care and awesomeness. And really, you know, I don't know if it was sex and drugs and rock and roll, but it certainly was whatever he wanted and uh, was kept shielded from that which might generate the compassion necessary to, uh, um, to want to heal people's suffering because first he would have to see suffering. So in his late twenties, uh, he actually went ahead and left the palace because he had a notion that there was something more than what he was being exposed to. And when he went outside the palace walls, he saw suffering. He saw old age, he saw old, old people, he saw sickness, he saw lepers, and he saw death, he saw you know, the charnel grounds. And it, he, he was overwhelmed. Think of, think of the first time you ever just noticed that, oh my gosh, there's suffering and I want to help this being that I see suffering. And just the whole of it overwhelmed him. And then he also saw an ascetic. He saw a spiritual seeker, someone in robes with a begging bowl. And he was like, oh, that's possibly probably the way uh, that I'm going to find the answer to this suffering question, which is now completely overwhelming. And so um, he went basically for about seven years, uh, seeking the guidance of all the best teachers throughout India. And basically would get to a place with each teacher where they would say, yeah, that, you know, he would be like, what's next? And the teacher would be like, that's all I got. And he'd be like, oh, okay. And so by the time at the end of the seven years, he was known as one of the premier, if not the premier teacher. And he was living the life of someone who had renounced everything you know, long matted hair, long fingernails, skin, you know, living on one grain of rice a day uh, and just sitting with his disciples and teaching. And the way the story goes uh, is that he was uh, by the river and there was a boat going down the river with some folks on it. And one of them was tuning up their guitar, their guitar-like instrument of the time. And they were tuning it up and someone said, Why, what are you doing? And he said, well, if it's too loose, it doesn't play. But if it's too tight, it breaks. And he had his sort of pre-enlightenment enlightenment. He was like, mind blown. Why am I eating a grain of rice a day? It's not about extreme you know, wealth and food and this and that. And it's not about renouncing it all to the point where I'm denying myself a, a body. And he decided that I need to find a middle path. And that's when he actually then sat under the Bodhi tree and um, over the course of eight days, uh, went through all kinds of experiences. Uh, and uh, on the eighth day, and by the way, uh, in Zen tradition and in a number of other traditions, uh, the day of his awakening was celebrated two days ago. Um, I actually sat some of a retreat that tracks it. We sit for eight days and then on the eighth day, we celebrate this awakening. When he had that awakening, he then taught for 45 years. And at first, when he had his awakening, he had no idea how to explain it. He's just like, I just, you know, I just don't even know. He's, and then he decided, I'm not even gonna try and explain it. And someone he met along the way said, you have to. And he's like, well, people have too much dust in their eyes. And this person said, well, maybe people who have a little less dust in their eyes can hear it. And so he went, he tried to teach it and people were like, what? And then he went back to his, you know, his uh, workshop and came up with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. 
And so really the way I like to look at it in terms of what I'm about to lay out here is, you know, he was a great uh, spiritual teacher, obviously, but you can also look at him as uh, an amazing psychologist. And, uh, you know, those of us, you know, like myself included, who don't spend a lot of time splitting up spirituality and science and psychology, um, uh, he really did a single person case study on himself um, for those seven years and then under the tree. Um, and then out of that, he was able to see that the cause of suffering was not the pain of life, but rather the clinging, craving, and aversion in response to the pleasure and pain. And that was at the core of it. And so that's how it came out in his psychology. And so Buddhist psychology as a whole uh, looks at how we think about our thoughts and experiences what our relationship is to our thoughts and experiences rather than focusing on the contents of the consciousness. The contents of the consciousness change and reveal themselves over time. Our dilemma is how do we relate to our thoughts and our experiences? So there's all kinds of systems around it, which are mindfulness is just one part of it. There's also systems around how do we live in community with each other? You know, how do we take care of each other in that way and just call it the worldly sense? And what we use mindfulness for is to basically look at mental states, look at emotional states, look at everything that causes suffering. And then also all that brings us peace and then start to have more choice. So those of you who are familiar with trauma therapy, this all might sound familiar, right? In other words, uh, there was a lot of trauma therapy uh, in Buddha's original conception. So uh, the whole purpose, uh, and this comes from Jack Kornfield, the whole purpose of Buddhist psychology, its ethics, philosophy, practices, and community life, all of it together, is the discovery that freedom and joy are possible in the face of the sufferings of human life. So the very basic or the first teaching and the primary teaching of the Buddha on suffering and the end of suffering uh, is at the heart of this matter. And what he said was the first truth of life is that there is suffering or dukkha is the word in Pali and Sanskrit in our lives that old age sickness and death are just there. And then all these other forms of suffering are there. But here's the thing, dukkha can also be translated as unsatisfactoriness, right? As in this traffic on the 405 sucks. I can't remember uh, my East Coast, you know, I grew up on Long Island, so the Southern State Parkway or the LIE, the BQE. Um, it's, it's on a continuum. Right? There's traffic on the LIE. I used to live, actually, I had an apartment where the BQE was like 10 feet away. <laughs> like literally, it was like raised up. Anyway, um, there, was some, there was some unsatisfactoriness to that, right? So there's, un there's, there's the ongoing, like this morning, my kid woke up. She's like, I don't wanna go to online school. Unsatisfactory. And I could turn it into suffering. We could start a big fight like that. So the nature of life is this sort of unsatisfactoriness after unsatisfactoriness with a little suffering in between. And that's what seems to be life. Which is why a lot of people then go, thanks for the lesson. I, I, you can take your Buddhism and you can put it over there somewhere. All right. But here's the second truth. The second truth says that the problem is or the cause of suffering, the cause and symptoms of suffering are the clinging the craving, the aversion, the unhealthy attachment to causes and conditions, to, to the traffic on the 405, right? I want this 405 traffic to stop, or I hate this 405 traffic. That's the suffering, the opinion about it, not the actual pain of it. So how do we end suffering? 
We can't end traffic on the 405, nor can we end old age sickness and death. So the third truth says, in order to end suffering, we need to go to the causes and conditions, the clinging, the craving, the aversion, the attachment. That's what we need to, to deal with. And if we do that, then we will have, like Jack Cornfield said, uh, uh, ease and joy in the face of the suffering of human life. And then his fourth truth was the Eightfold Path, which basically describes how one might be able to end the clinging, the craving, the aversion. And so that Eightfold Path is building wisdom. And again, uh, much like 12 Steps or lots of other designs, yes, it's in order, but it's also, you know, it's, it's not all over the place, but different points come in at different times, but if looking at it as a path it, with eight steps to it, as it were, wisdom is built. Uh, oftentimes what we think about is we need enough wisdom to know this might be a good idea to try it out. Um, uh, then setting intention, right? Out of that wisdom, I set intention. Uh, what am I going to do? Thought precedes action, right? So I make an intention. I, I make micro intentions constantly. Like each time before I start speaking again, I, intend, I make an intention to start, keep speaking, right? So there's micro intentions and then there's macro intentions. So I'm always setting intention. And then I live in the world in three, way, three major ways. Speech, what do I say? Action, what do I do across the board? And then livelihood which is what really pointed me towards this as a design for people like ourselves who are professional helpers. Livelihood is one of the factors, right, of the Eightfold Path for me to investigate and to live differently. And then lastly, there's three um, factors that are dedicated to mindfulness practice. Effort, which is specific to mindfulness practice. I make an effort to be more mindful. And then mindfulness and concentration thinking of mindfulness as that sort of broader, uh, you know, uh, non-judgmental present time awareness and concentration as being concentration, single pointed concentration, which often helps to build mindfulness. So here's why clinical Dharma is because he actually designed this using the medical model of the time, Ayurveda. Uh, so this Four Noble Truths, when he went back into his workshop, he was like, all right, this is how people will understand it. This is how people will be able to do it. So the diagnosis is suffering. The symptoms and the causes of suffering are the cra craving, the clinging, the aversion, the unhealthy attachment, the cure, right? You're at the doctor's office. Here's your cure. Get into and through these causes and conditions so that we might end suffering. And then the prescription is the Eightfold Path. So this was already, this was designed as a healing balm for all. And so why not, especially with the amount of compassion that we're uh, required to apply why not use it as uh, something to be used directly with compassion fatigue? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the truths and the path a little bit uh, to just give you a little bit more context. Um, I might be uh, you know, quoting directly, the, some of these are all passages from, from the book, um, but a little I'll also be riffing a little bit um, off of, um, off of uh, the, the words from the book. Um, so I'm actually gonna read that first one. Our interpretation of the first truth can be something like this. I have seen suffering in its many forms, in myself and others, and I am utterly moved to find some way that I can end that suffering or at least reduce it. Um, I don't know about you all. Um, I have felt that almost nonstop since I got sober. Well, we didn't, we didn't put that in the mix. I guess I said, when I was four months sober, I was brought to the Buddhist monastery uh, for the AA retreat. Um, so I've been, uh, I've been in recovery for 31 years. And from the beginning, 
when I first had a sponsor say to me, you see that guy over there who has like 10 days less than you? Help him. Ever since then, everything has been pointed towards service. Everything has been pointed towards how can I end suffering? I mean, a lot of the times it was, I'm gonna use air quotes here, selfish in that I just wanted my suffering to end. And here's the thing, that's often where it starts, right? That's why so many people who come into recovery end up becoming such compassionate souls. If they weren't actively that way beforehand, whether we come into this as a livelihood or not, uh, people are just so desirous after having their own suffering relieved to relieve the suffering of others. And this is why, this is what Buddha discovered 2,600 years ago, is that this suffering, it's this universal thing. And so however we come to the realization of it, whether it be through our own suffering, whether it be through just somehow being innately able to be empathic to others. I don't remember how I was as a kid around these issues. I kind of remember feeling a lot of um, compassion and empathy for people. My kid is ridiculously empathic. It's like, almost like, whoa, dude. And uh, that was a clinical term, <laughs> whoa, dude. So I, you know, I, I look at the way she is and I'm like, wow, you know, she's got that. She doesn't need to suffer herself for her to get that. It doesn't matter how we get there. Uh, the, point, the point being though, is that last statement, our successful maintenance of a life as a helper depends on our going beyond our initial starting point and investigating suffering with a spirit of curiosity. In other words, for a lot of us, we just get, you know, obviously if any of us who are in recovery, we suffered, right? And there's this suff ball of suffering that was going on nonstop. We weren't investigating it, we were just in it. And so then when we're in recovery and then people that we're working with, we can help them to investigate suffering from a little bit of a distance and just like noticing what suffering is and be able to get a little bit of, not the kind of distance like denial distance, but just enough distance to be able to just go, oh, there it is, suffering. That is true, suffering exists. So the second truth is pertinent in our work because what I noticed over the last years that I've been, before I was a uh, therapist, I was an educator. So even in that profession, I saw that I craved a positive result or I might have an aversion to a negative result and I often would have an attachment to the result regardless. In other words, I wanted my kids who I was teaching English to be able to read and write and do all those things and, and feel empowered to communicate in the world. Um, and I was averse to the possibility that they wouldn't, right? And that I needed to be able to step back and know that whatever their process is, is their process. And that suffering is true, but I can do what I can to reduce my suffering, to help reduce their suffering. And then when I was a, certainly when I was a social justice and, and inclusion diversity trainer, like every time I was in a workshop, I would just, I would have some craving, but I would enact my own uh, abilities uh, that I've developed over time to be able to step away and investigate or to look at this with curiosity. Um, so, uh, I need to, again, going back to that word, investigation, I need to really look at what are the causes and conditions of the suffering, both of myself and the other. So here's the third truth. And Buddha was emphatic. This is where, you know, we move into uh, what pe when people start to talk about more spirituality than science, if you're going to split the two. Right? He was like, suffering can end. Right? And so how can it end? It can end by somehow completely renouncing the causes of it. And so 
one thing that I noticed is that recovery from diagnosable addiction acts as proof of the theorem of the third truth. That's some, some of what got me to this place. If I am able to change my karma in regards to substances and or behaviors through changing or abstaining from these compulsive and repetitive behaviors, then suffering can end. So our own recovery, or my own recovery, is proof that the third noble truth is pretty true. And then those of us who continue into longer term recovery, we see that happen again and again as a result of the work that we do, whether it's 12 step or otherwise. And so what does renunciation look like a little bit more? Um, it's just willingness to practice restraint. It's being able to have mindful relationship with food, with sense of touch, what I take in with my senses. We don't need to get rid of all our belongings. You know, there's like, you know, uh, when, I, when I came home from the Zen monastery, having lived there for a year, there was a part of me that was like, and now time to sell everything and live on a futon, you know, with, uh, with maybe an alarm clock, right? Um, that's not the way it has to happen. And that's, and that's not the teaching. That's not the middle path. So renunciation is developing mindfulness around these things and being able to you know, uh, make adjustments when necessary. And again, this is all part and parcel. This is all related to the fullness of what it is I'm suggesting in clinical dharma as a way of uh, positioning ourselves in therapeutic engagement and in, and in informal engagement in order to uh, not end up in compassion fatigue. If I'm having that restraint with my senses, eventually, I learn how to sit more comfortably with distress, more comfortably with my distress, with your distress. So in the end, it's like going to the gym, right? It's like we just do these tiny acts of renunciation. One of the examples that I use a lot, and I use it in the book, is you know, in, in, uh, in meditation, in mindfulness, in Zen meditation, you sit completely silently, completely motionless for long periods of time. Without fail, at some point in the, in the sitting, my knee starts to hurt. And I'm like, ah, my knee hurts, my knee hurts. And eventually I move and it never helps. It usually kind of gets worse. And um, I'm noticing a little delay. Sam, can you give me a yes or no if I'm good? You're good. Okay, thank you. So, um, so the knee never feels better. It actually usually feels worse. When I renounce, meaning that I sit through it, right? Eventually the knee pain tends to go away, usually because I developed the last statement, a spirit of friendliness towards my body, towards our pains and our little itches, right? A spirit of loving kindness, and also a little sense of kind of like, eh, you know, when I'm thinking of it as my knee, it's very painful. When I'm able to just go knee, pain, just notice that, um, much less painful. And so the fourth, Noble truth is a path, a practical guide to living. It's grounded in wisdom, uh, in compassionately ethical behavior and in meditation. So uh, a lot of uh, clinical mindfulness, I'm not, I'm not saying all clinical mindfulness, but a lot of the clinical mindfulness movement, which by the way, thank goodness, right? Um, when EMDR therapy was developed 30 years ago, uh, one of the reasons why the developer of it, Francine Shapiro, didn't mention mindfulness as one of the things that brought her to it was because at that time, there was one article in all of the clinical literature that year about mindfulness. So if she had said, oh, mindfulness, there, already there was something about EMDR that made people go, come on, right? So if she had added that, now there's you know, over a thousand articles a year in clinical literature about mindfulness. So thank goodness. A lot of the, the clinical mindfulness has been uh, the ethical aspect and, and even the wisdom aspect have been extracted and it's much more skills training based. 
And so a lot of what we're offering with clinical Dharma and other folks are doing it with uh, things like ethical mindfulness, Stephen Batchelor's work and other folks um, is bringing the, the ethical behavior back in. And actually uh, for those of you who are 12 step focused, um, there is a, a link uh, between uh, the Eightfold Path uh, and the 12 Steps, according to Dr. Bob, um, who edited a pamphlet in the early Akron group in the 40s uh, that was about spirituality in general and AA and the 12 Steps. And Dr. Bob said, uh, we've looked at all the spiritual traditions of the millennia, and the one that seems to most match our 12 Steps is the eight-part program of the Buddha, right? This is 1940s Ohio. Um, so, uh, in any case, the, the fact that AA and then also Buddhism says we need to put this into action, that this is about, this is not just about like, oh, I've just had this enlightened thought. This is about how do we live it in the world. Um, so, which is very helpful since what we're doing as healers and helpers is we're living this in the world, right? We are going out of our way to bring our compassion, bring our loving kindness, bring our joy when we have it, bring our, uh, our whatever balance we have, whatever equanimity we develop uh, to our work and to the folks we work with. So the Eightfold Path, it's in order because that's how we read them and digest them. In fact, it's more of a, a little bit of a winding road. Again, using the 12 steps as a, an example, uh, you know, it's a design for living, but it's not rigid. It's structured, but not rigid. And you know, sometimes it's thought of as a wheel, sometimes it's thought of as a path. Um, as you can see, there's you know, spokes <laughs> in the wheel as it were. Uh, so there, you know, there's all kinds of connections going on, um, but it starts to the right of the uh, top yellow um, arrow, wise understanding or wisdom, uh, wise intention, wise speech. And I think it's really interesting that speech comes before action. I like to think of that because speech is so tricky and can get us into such problems before we even go into action. And also it includes internal speech, which is constantly going on, right? So how do I get to wise speech? How do I get to wise action? How am I wise in my livelihood? 2,600 years ago, Buddha had a list of professions that were not wise because they did harm. Uh, they were harmful instead of harmless or even uh, harm reducing, um, like don't sell poison, things like that. Uh, so uh, when we look at, you know, I remember when I first uh, started practicing and I was early in recovery, I was like, all right, why is livelihood? You know, I can do that one, you know? So it's one that we all kind of do by default, but we still have to work at it. Um, and also taking care of ourselves and buffering against compassion fatigue allows us to continue to do wise livelihood. And then, like I said before, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. Those are all the path of mindfulness that was very unique at the time. So 2,600 years ago, a lot of the meditation practices were about like escaping or get, you know, getting to other realms as quickly as possible, you know, levitating, that kind of thing. Whereas Buddha said, no, don't turn away from the pain to find some other place, turn towards the pain right? That was the radical and very psychology, you know, like if we're talking psychology and any, any, if not most of Western, Eastern, and other psychologies, indigenous, you know, point towards that uh, truth. So as I said before, the reason it's at the top of the list, wisdom, is because I need just enough wisdom to know it's a good idea, just like the first step. Right? I need to just have that much wisdom and then my wisdom can build through starting to set wise intentions. Uh, when I talk about addiction, I actually often use the example of, you know, my wisdom level in the 80s was I knew where the dealers were and which bars were open when, and then I would set my intention to arrive there on time to receive my medicine. Um, then when I went into recovery, I knew where all the meetings in my neighborhood were at what time, and I would set my intention to get to that meeting, 
right? So that's just one very simple example of moment to moment, hour to hour, uh, we are uh, setting intention. Sometimes we're setting intention for the next moment. Sometimes we're setting an intention for like when we apply to a school that takes four years to go through, right? I set the intention to get this uh, degree. So um, in the helping professions, um, at the bottom there, third bullet point, if we're in the helping professions, that intention will always have the undercurrent and foundation of service, right? If we start to get into this groove of being a helper and healer, then that intention is always geared towards service. I'm just gonna read this first piece. Right speech can be looked at as knowing that our words have power, power over ourselves and power over the other. They have the infinite power to heal and they have also the power to do great harm. So developing mindfulness around that, including self-talk, right? Self-talk, which can be brutal, right? For not, not just for the people we're helping, but for ourselves. How do we monitor that? How do we heal that? How do we take care of ourselves and be able to start to you know, sometimes talk back to that. I'm gonna take a leap here and share with you uh, um, my, uh, my sponsor, Saul, through my, uh, I would say my middle 15 years of recovery. Um, he used to say, and he never swore, right? He never used bad language. So it made this uh, even more potent. He said, when those voices come to you and they're saying, you're not good enough, you're crap, you're this, you're that, Tell them, thanks for sharing. If they continue, say, thanks for sharing, go fuck yourself. And that's like at the bottom line of the very bottom line of how do I start to heal that self-talk? But then once I begin to develop more mindfulness, more loving kindness, perhaps it's a different type of engagement or it's not so loud that I have to tell it to take a hike like that. And then right action is basically everything else that we do, right? Everything from the smallest to the largest, right? And that's where you see lots of teachers like Thich Nhat Hanh and other folks who really teach like, how do we bring mindfulness to washing the dishes and drying the dishes? How do we bring mindfulness to each little engagement? Because each little engagement matters. And our goal as helpers and healers is to be of help and not to harm. And I will actually speak to this point of uh, being as true to oneself as one's resources and abilities will allow at each given moment of our development. In other words, I'm not always the person who's going to be responsible for someone's healing. I might not have the tool. I might not be the right fit. I might not be, I don't think, I don't, I should not think that I have to heal everybody all the time. I can delegate <laughs> or I can refer or I can pass on or I can bring in a team, right? So um, that's wise livelihood too. Right effort means that I'm going to, when I need to, uh, avoid a behavior or a thought system. I do that. I make effort to eliminate or transform them. And I make effort to lead a mindful, skillful uh, life. And then, as I said before, we're not disconnecting from painful states and difficulties uh, per se. We're cultivating a mindfulness of it all, every aspect of life. I've been running a meditation for the last 260 blah, blah, blah days. I don't know how many days it is now, right? Since March 14th, when LA shut down. And I've been giving the same instructions every single meditation. Just we sit for 20 minutes. I give about 12 minutes of instruction. And I just keep saying, just notice that thought has taken you off of your object of meditation. Notice what you're noticing. And then come back to your breath or your body. Right? So uh, we're just getting 
more and more to the place of as much as we can a non-judgmental awareness infused with acceptance of what is. Uh, one of the primary teachings of a lot of modern Buddhist teachers is uh, right now it's like this. And then wise concentration is developed through you know, developing a number of possible meditation practices um, that basically helps to retrain the mind a little bit, right? Because the natural state of the mind, by the way, I, I haven't said this yet, I'm glad I'm thinking of it, is meditation is not designed to clear the mind. A lot of people think, I can't meditate, I can't clear my mind. That's not a thing. There's no such thing. Talk to a guru, talk to a Zen master, they're still like, you know, I wonder if spaghetti's for dinner tonight. I mean, the mind is always going, right? What we're doing is we're changing our relationship to it. We're retraining the mind to be a little more skillful at not going off and being what the Buddhists call monkey mind, right? From branch to branch to branch to branch and being able to go, okay, come back to the object of meditation. Getting better at dropping back into the moment again and again. But it's a practice and there's a number of practices uh, including the four foundations of mindfulness, which is another primary teaching of Buddha that help us to do that. And so discovering what practices uh, might work for you. And so all that I've been talking about comes under the heading, let's say of the Dharma, the teachings of historical, the historical Buddha. And so the four foundations, like I said, is the mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feeling tone, mindfulness of mind, and mindfulness of dharmas. And essentially that is just saying we can use those four different objects of meditation to do the work that we're doing. I can be mindful of my body states, including my breathing, that's mindfulness of body. I can be mindful of feeling tone, which is not mad, sad, glad, but rather it is sitting with and noticing uh, any emotion or thought or body sensation, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Try and come up with another rating, right? Right, our entire lives basically can be rated that way, right? Like temperature in this room right now, so pleasant. I totally nailed it. It's just, it's like fall in here. I love fall. I feel like I'm back on the East Coast for y'all um, or those of you who are on the East Coast. Um, uh, the uh, being here with you, pleasant. Um, uh, I'm not having any unpleasant lists right now. I'll try to come, oh, when my daughter said, I don't wanna go to online school today, that was unpleasant. <laughs> it's still, I just unpleasant. But that's it, I just noticed unpleasant. And then I went on, right? So we can use that. And what that does is it increases distress tolerance. It makes it so that there, it's less about pleasant and unpleasant. It's just pleasant, unpleasant and neutral. And we're more able to navigate the world uh, in that way. And then mindfulness of mind, and I would call that more advanced training. And I actually encourage folks generally to just stick with um, the other three, um, but it's being able to, to observe your mind without getting lost in it. And then lastly, mindfulness of dharmas is mindfulness of teachings or mindfulness of truth, uh, like contemplating uh, the Four Noble Truths or a very common example is I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, have heard at, at one time or another of loving kindness meditation. So loving kindness meditation is in fact a mindfulness of dharma's uh, practice. And so there they are. And by the way, uh, um, I don't know how this will manifest, but I'm glad for anyone to have this PowerPoint um, after afterwards. So we'll talk to Sam about uh, that. Um, and then, uh, this, I, this is not my uh, system, but I did go into it further uh, in uh, my anger management book, Mindfulness for Anger Management, um, which is Rain. Uh, Tara Brock, and I'm, I think her name is Michelle McDonald, is, is who came up with it first, but Tara Brock, I think, made it uh, more popular, is to recognize, to allow, to investigate, and to nurture. So sitting with and recognizing, oh, I have this emotion, then allow it which doesn't mean like, let it overtake me. It just means allow it, right? Investigate it, get clarity about it, and then provide nurture for myself. This is a, a big part of clinical dharma and then just anything that I ever teach about anything 
uh, trauma recovery, EMDR, et cetera, is that, uh, or intervention, right? Formal intervention is the last step of intervention. The last step of any of these experiences is to provide myself with some resilience and some nurture when it's over, right? Because this is actually hard work, right? This is, um, this is intense. This is, this is real life. Sorry, I'm having a hard time. What am I doing? All right, here we go. Um, so we recognize, um, helps us to label an experience, to separate it from, a little, from it a little bit. Um, allow is, allows it to happen exactly as they are in the moment. And so we are now, hopefully, the goal is that we arrive at a state that's a bit detached from the clinging, the craving, the avoidance, or the aversion. And by the way, going back to the science, um, really what Buddha intuited was the action of the limbic brain and the body, right? The amygdala, right? The fight or flight, clinging and craving and avoidance and aversion, that's all fight or flight. Um, that's all what drives us and then often keeps us from being able to develop insight. It's what trauma therapy helps us to heal is maladaptively, form, uh, maladaptively processed memories are residing in the limbic system or in the body, which is not a good place for long-term storage. There's no insight. And our goal is to bring it to insight mind. So being detached from that um, craving, clinging, aversion. Um, and then we're able to use the wise part of our mind to discover, most importantly, first bullet point, the impermanence of our current state of mind. Another absolutely primary teaching of the Buddha is the impermanent nature of all things, all feeling states, all thoughts. And once we see that, then we're able to let them go more easily. And then nurture. And this is, again, like I said, uh, clinical dharma really, uh, and, and buffering against compassion fatigue really leans into this. Self-care is critical. And it's the acknowledgement of the suffering that we go through and then the application of whatever nurturing our mind, body, and spirit need. And so when we send ourselves compassion after doing all this work, it, it stabilizes our nervous system and allows us to integrate uh, that which we are able to get from the experience. So, um, so if you do pause long enough to do this, every now and then, even five minutes a day, something shifts. It won't be perfect. You may not think I'm a liberated being, but you'll have more access to your, uh, as I say here, or Tara Brock says here, more access to your evolved heart mind, more access to your intelligence and your compassion and your empathy. So that practice, the practice of RAIN, the result is you're able to tap into the compassion as opposed to not have it available anymore. Another primary teaching of the Buddha is taking refuge. Taking refuge means uh, taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. It doesn't mean taking refuge in the historical Buddha like as a god or, or such. It's about uh, Buddha taught that he had an experience. This is what he learned. Here's how I did it. He taught us how to do it and we can have the same exact experience. So taking refuge in, in our all innate Buddhahood, as it were. Uh, the dharmas, the teachings, any and all teachings. And the Sangha, this is key. This is another thing where there's such a connection between 12 step and uh, Buddhist teaching is that Sangha community of others is one of the three jewels. I mean, it's, it's one of the legs of the three legged stool. It's, absolutely critical. So uh, yes, this has been hard uh, during COVID. And like I said, thank goodness for this technology. Thank goodness for anything and everything we've been able to do to stay connected because it's critical. So many teachers come into our lives. I've had so many wonderful teachers and mentors and I still do. Um, and I hope you have yours and uh, that you find more. Here's, uh, there's a number of other teachings here um, that you can investigate, but living in alignment with these teachings 
um, helps us and particularly this developing and maintaining some kind of mindfulness practice um, can be key. Um, and um, we need community uh, just with each other. We also need community with each other as healers and helpers, which is part of why I like to present this particular presentation um, because I feel like it's helpful in alerting us or reminding us to uh, either maintain or increase our community, uh, um, the folks in our community. I cannot believe that I just clicked on the question slide at exactly 1145. That is not like me. I am, I am, I, I think I'm like a lot of my colleagues. Often there's like the last 10 slides are like click, 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 click. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm mindfulness in a lot of areas. And maybe that one is not as much as others. So anyway, um, before I take the questions, um, I just wanna say uh, thank you. Um, these four phrases are for uh, Sharon Sal, there's Sharon Salzberg's loving kindness phrases. There are other versions of this, but I hope that you and those that you work with may be free from fear, may you be healed, or um, yes, may you be healed, may you be happy, and may you be at ease. That's my wish for you. And I'm glad to take any questions about any of the material or any of the potential applications of it or anything else that's on your mind. So again, I thank you for joining me and I'll kick it back to Sam to let me know if there's any questions. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure whether or not I've come back into screen, but that's not a problem if, if I haven't. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I can see that there are some there, there are some chats mainly just saying, oh, can we watch it again? Because there was so much information. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Please, can I have the slides? Um, and I just, I, you know, I wanted to just touch on a, a, a few things. I really appreciated um, you taking us through the Eightfold Path points um, and the wise pathway there. And incredible that Dr. Bob um, spoke about this um, back in the 1940s. I mean, that's incredible, right? Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, um, it ceases to amaze me, actually, um, the wisdom that those guys had back then. Um, and then the other thing I, I wanted to touch on was just the simplicity with which you you named the three parts um, of being able to recognize a reaction and having the time to breathe into it, the unpleasant, the pleasant and the neutral. I found that very useful, a really useful exercise to be able to start to practice. Um, because as you said throughout, you know, in order for us to find the opportunity to, to deal with our fatigue, whether or not it's compassionate or it's emotional or it's physical, um, having these short mantras and tools and resources to be able to use um, as we try and find the time to extend our practices, um, they're crucial. So I loved that, the unpleasant, pleasant, neutral breathing into that. And um, you touched on Tara and the uh, four principles of mindful transformation. But I just want to finish really, and I think it is really poignant. Um, and to hear that you've been running a meditation uh, for the whole of COVID and, and as you say, the, the, how technology, and I think even, uh, it may have been in the third edition of the big book, it mentions in the foreword about, you, you know, as we come into an era of computers and modem to modem, little did they know what we would be coming into in 2020 um, and how we would be absolutely sort of hanging on to that to get the connectedness. And you mentioned the 12 step and the um, Sangha and the community and the importance of staying connected and how those line up so 
so beautifully. And uh, I just really appreciated uh, your presentation. It's always an honor. I remember watching you for the first time when we were uh, at the Cape Cod and um, listening to you today has been actually kind of quite mindful and relaxing for me. Um, I have a question here, um, <laughs> which is, has anyone, this is from Judy Johnson, who says, has anyone written more about the connection of the 12 steps with the Dharma? Good question, Judy. Yeah, so um, a couple of people have. Um, uh, so uh, I think his name is Darren Littlejohn, has a book or two that does that connection. Um, and then uh, Kevin Griffin is uh, the most prolific writer uh, about that many, many years ago. He was like, 12 steps in Buddhism, they go together. And so he's written a number of books. As a matter of fact, I think he is coming out with a daily meditation reader um, uh, that is um, focused on that. And then also this, uh, uh, so Jamie Marich, my colleague, I met her through her writing uh, the book Trauma and the 12 Steps. And she wrote that back in 2009 or so. And I basically tracked her down, dragged her out to LA from Ohio. And we've been working together ever since. And so she, North Atlantic Books just put out uh, the uh, second edition of Trauma and the 12 Steps. And then she and I wrote a step workbook and a uh, daily meditation reader. Uh, that goes with it. And the reason I mention is because she's very steeped in more yoga traditions and uh, dance and movement traditions. And I'm obviously more, uh, mo more in, in the Buddhist traditions. And so there's, and because the two of us both are like trauma, Buddha, yoga, you know, 12 steps, they all go to get right. It's all a thing. So there's a lot of Dharma. I guess that's a long way of saying there's a lot of Dharma uh, in that book. And in um, particularly in the daily meditation reader, like very specifically. But Kevin Griffin is the most prolific one. And like I said, I think he's got a new book coming out soon. Thanks, Steve. I have another question here. Um, and that's from Rebecca. Um, I'm very curious as to the conditions that impact an individual's capacity to see or set intent and start out on a path of healing transformation. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So so that, that, thank you for that question because that speaks to, you know, wisdoms at the front, right? And then it's, um, it's, it's enough wisdom to get started. And then the other factors of the path enable us to develop new and greater, more profound, you know, just healthier, let's say, call it wisdom, you know, along the way. Um, uh, for another, for instance, I was giving that, um, for instance, of you know how I would set the better intention about going to a meeting, you know I think about all the intentions that I set that resulted in me making decisions that brought me into different professions that I've been in, right? Like first as a teacher, and then I would go into my mindfulness practice and develop new insight from those experiences, develop new insight from the compassion, the deep compassion I felt from my students. And that would go into my wisdom bucket. And that would then inform the next round of intentions. And I can, and I look at that from the, like within a day perspective, I look at it from a day-to-day -day perspective. And then I look at it from, you know, like these larger, more existential questions of, you know, of long-term sustainable uh, ways of living uh, that um, allow us to, you know, continue to build in wisdom and then leverage that wisdom to, to try and end suffering. Thank you, Stephen, so much. That's great. And um, I think that's uh, all the questions that I have. And I just want to say thank you so much to our attendees. I've got people saying thank you, thank you. Um, Stephen, it's been a pleasure. I hope that you will come back and join us again because it's a to be continued um, for sure. And yeah, just people saying brilliant and um, thank you. And uh, you really have given us some great, great tools and resources. And the time with you has been 
very, very healing. Um, so much appreciated. Thank you so much to all of you for, for, for watching and being with us. We're back again on January the 21st um, with Dr. Mel Pohl, who again is an absolute um, favorite of mine. He's the author of A Day Without Pain, and he's presenting on pain and addiction, the clinician's role in treating this complex uh, disorder. So hopefully, hopefully you'll join us for that webinar. Um, once again, Stephen, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Go safe. Thank you and thank everyone for, for coming.